Welcome to your online lecture for the book of Job, which is part of chapter 8 in your textbook. In this video, we'll have a few points regarding the literary world of the book of Job, then we'll read through the story of Job, and then we'll conclude with some theological points regarding the book. The book of Job is certainly one of the best known books of the Hebrew Bible, if not also in the wider body of world literature. Its tale of a righteous man suffering unjustly as the result of a friendly wager between God and one of his heavenly counselors has long stirred recipients and readers' as imagination and indignation. Indeed, the biblical book has provided more than its share of artistic and literary responses, and more than a few indignant attempts to overcome its offense in antiquity. The book of Job begins with a narrative prologue that establishes the peculiar relationships among God, Satan, and Job. It continues with poetic speeches from Job, his friends, and God, and concludes with a narrative epilogue. As you hear the story, I invite you to reflect on your discussion questions. What meaning do you derive from the story? Based on what textual evidence? Does the book offer comfort or confusion, or both, for people struggling to make sense out of seemingly meaningless suffering? According to your reading of the book of Job, what is the nature of the relationship between God and humans? The Story of Job There once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had seven thousand sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred yoke of oxen, five hundred donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered him, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God, and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house, and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, all that he has is in your power, only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking in the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell on them and carried them off and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels, and carried them off, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came across the desert, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with any wrongdoing. One day the heavenly beings came again to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, Skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their own lives. But stretch out your hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job, 
from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this Job did not sin with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Why is light given to one in misery, and life to the bitter in soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures? Then Alphaz the Temanite answered, Think now, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? How happy is the one whom God reproves! Therefore, do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he wounds, but he binds up. He strikes, but his hands heal. Then Job answered, Teach me, and I will be silent. Make me understand how I have gone wrong. Turn, I pray, let no wrong be done. Turn now, my vindication is at stake. My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens, then breaks out again. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. If I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of humanity? Why have you made me your target? Why have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie in the earth. Then Bildad the Shuite answered, Does God pervert justice, or does the Almighty pervert the right? See, God will not reject a blameless person, nor take the hand of evil doers. Then Job answered, Indeed, I know that this is so, but how can a mortal be just before God? He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has resisted him and succeeded? He who removes mountains, and they do not know it, when he overturns them in his anger. He snatches away. Who can stop him? Who will say to him, What are you doing? God will not turn his back on his anger. Though I am innocent, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. If I summoned him and he answered me, I do not believe that he would listen to my voice, for he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. Then Zophar the Naamathite answered, But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for wisdom is many-sided. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Then Job answered, The tents of robbers are at peace, and those who provoke God are secure, who bring their God in their hands. As for you, you whitewash with lies, all of you are worthless physicians. If you would only keep silent, that would be your wisdom. Hear now my reasoning, and listen to the pleadings of my lips. Only grant two things to me, then I will not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand far from me, and do not let dread of you terrify me. Then call, and I will answer, or let me speak, and you reply to me, How many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? Then Elphaz the Temanite answered, For your iniquity teaches your mouth, and you choose the tongue of the crafty, so that you turn your spirit against God, and let such words go out of your mouth. What are mortals that they can be clean? or those born of women, that they can be righteous. God puts no trust even in his holy ones, and the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much less one who is abominable and corrupt, one who drinks iniquity like water. Then Job answered, 
God gives me up to the ungodly and casts me into the hands of the wicked. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own family. Have pity on me. Have pity on me, O you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Then Zophar the Naamathite answered, Do you not know this from of old, ever since mortals were placed on earth, that the exalting of the wicked is short, and the joy of the godless is but for a moment? Even though they mount up high as the heavens, and their head reaches to the clouds, they will perish for ever like their own dung. Those who have seen them will say, Where are they? They swallow down riches and vomit them up again. God cast them out of their bellies. To fill their belly to the full, God will send his fierce anger into them, and rain it upon them as their food. Then Job answered, Why do the wicked live on, reach old age, and grow in mighty in power? Their children are established in their presence, and their offspring before their eyes. They spend their days in prosperity and in peace. They go down to Sheol. You say, God stores up their iniquity for their children. Let it be paid back to them, so that they may know it. Then Alphaz the Temanite answered, Can a mortal be of use to God? Can even the wisest be of service to him? Is it for your piety that he reproves you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great? There is no end to your iniquities. You have given no water to the weary to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. You have sent widows away empty-handed, and the arms of the wid orphans you have crushed. Therefore snares are around you, and sudden terror overwhelms you. As God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak falsehood, and my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right until I die. I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days, because I delivered the poor who cried and the orphan who had no helper. If my step has turned aside from the way, and my heart has followed my eyes, and if any spot has clung to my hands, then let me sow, and another eat, and let what grows from me be rooted out. Oh, that I had one to hear me! Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary! I would give him an account of all my steps, like a prince I would approach him. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job, because they were older than he. But Elihu saw that there were no answer in the mouths of these three men. He became angry. My heart is indeed like wine that has no vent, like new wineskins, it is ready to burst. I must speak so that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. But now hear my speech, O Job, and listen to all my words. If not, listen to me, be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words. You say, I am clean without transgression. I am pure, and there is no iniquity in me. Look, he finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemies. Therefore hear me, you who have sense, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. For according to their deeds he will repay them, and according to their ways he will make it befall them. Of a truth God will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, and if they are bound in fetters and caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions, that they are behaving arrogantly. He opens their ears to instruct and commands that they return from iniquity. Beware, do not turn to iniquity, because of that you have been tried by affliction. See, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? 
When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light, and where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home? Surely you know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Have you snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Can you send forth lightning, so that they may go and say to you, Here we are? Do you know when the mountain goat gives birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you number the months that they fulfill, and do you know the time when they give birth? Do you give the horse its might? Do you clothe its neck with mane? Is it by your wisdom that the hawk soars and spread its wings toward the south? Shall a fault-finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. Then Job answered the Lord, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but will proceed no further. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like this? Deck yourself with majesty and dignity, clothe yourself with glory and splendor, pour out the overflowings of your anger, and look on all who are proud and abase them. Look on all who are proud and bring them low, tread down the wicked where they stand, hide them all in the dust together, bind their faces in the world below, then I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can give you victory. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Therefore I despise myself, and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Elphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has done. So Elphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite went and did what the Lord had told them, And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had fourteen thousand sheep, six thousand camel, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters, In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived for one hundred and forty years, and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. Take time now to consider your initial reactions. What are your thoughts and feelings? Turn now to your discussion questions. What meaning do you derive from the story? Based on what textual evidence? Does the book offer comfort or confusion, or both? According to your reading of the book of Job, what is the nature of the relationship between God and humans? 
it's not hard to see how the book of Job can evoke so many different types of theological reflection by scholars or lay people, believers or unbelievers. For our purposes, let's look on three dimensions of the book's theological richness. The first, what it suggests about the reasons for human piety in relation to God. Second, what it indicates about the way humans relate to one another as everyday theologians. And third, what it communicates regarding the nature of a lived relationship with the Almighty. The book of Job offers a glimpse into why we have expression of belief to God. In the beginning of the story, we hear of Job's great piety. We learn that he is pious because he is rewarded for his reverence to God. Notice how at this point, God isn't clear about the connection between being reverent and being rewarded. In spite of Job's tra tragic losses, his piety and reverence to God still persists. However, it's not long before we hear that Job agrees with his friends that God should and does reward the righteous and punish the wicked. Remember, this is a fundamental understanding of God. This is the central notion in the Torah of retributive justice. God's response, though, offers no confidence that such a connection is true in practice. In fact, it reminds us of one basic truth, that God is a mighty creator of all things, and humans know not the ways of God. Job's response is continued reverence and belief for God in spite of what he has learned, or not, about God's righteousness. The speech ends in chapter 42, and the reader seems to be urged towards embracing a similar view. At last, the book offers one more twist. God rebukes Job's friends for their views and restores Job doubly what he lost. Oddly enough, the God of retributive justice returns, leaving us to wonder, does God live by our notions of retributive justice? What the book of Job also reminds us is that theology is not so much systematic reflections on an ivory tower but a diverse and often conflicting claims about God made by believers who live amid joys and suffering. From the urgings of Job's wife that he curse God and die, to the arguments of Elphaz, Zophar, and Bildad, to the speechifying of Elihu, to Job's responses to his wife and his friends, this book is filled with claims about the true nature of God, claims that often compete vigorously with one another. Finally, if nothing else, the book of Job reveals to readers of every generation that life lived in God's sight is most definitely not the perfectly ordered existence popular piety has sought since humanity first conceived a divine creator and overseer. Instead, the ancient author of this book seems to express for every reader of every age a simple yet fearsome to many truth, that is, life with God is unpredictable full of mystery and wonder, joy and sorrow, good and evil. Life with God evokes as many questions about human experience as it provides answers. At a most human level, Job provides to its readers an experience of this truth and a challenge to live with it in faith and trust, or not.